This video is sponsored by NordPass, a new service powered by the more popular NordVPN service. NordPass not only generates highly complex passwords instantly, but also auto-fills and auto-saves them, utilizing top-of-field encryption technology. In other words, that whole remember my password link that you always click on hesitantly, but do it anyway because you're too lazy to type in your password every single time, can be done directly through NordPass, but with significantly more security, all the while containing a more complex password that can be generated with just the click of a button. Like, you literally just click and log in with one master password for everything without even having to think about anything else at all. And also, while still protecting all of your passwords and personal account information, better than you ever could on your own before. Not to mention, you'll never have to worry about forgetting or losing your password ever again. NordPass takes care of all of that and works on pretty much every single internet browser, even some of those old weird ones that barely anyone even uses anymore. Oh, and don't worry, your mobile devices can be protected as well. You can get 50% off of the already ridiculously low price, plus an additional month for free if you use my promo code from nothing. Or just go to nordpass.com slash from nothing, which I'll leave a link to below. So basically you'll be getting this awesome service for just $2.49 a month, all the while supporting the continuation and growth of from nothing in the process. Everybody wins. Hello everyone, it's Jabar here. Today's video is a patron request. If you'd like to make a video request of your own, you can do so by becoming a patron. The link to this can be found below. What if West Africa industrialized on its own? If you haven't seen part one yet, I highly recommend that you watch it before continuing this video. Even if you have seen it, you may need a refresher anyway because I made it a really long time ago. Like, two years ago. Special thanks to Sword of Africa for making this request in the first place and pretty much pushing me to go ahead and finish up this series, finally. I'll leave a link to part one of the series in the description below. Or I'll just summarize it for those of you who are too lazy. I discussed the scramble of Africa in an alternate scenario in which the rule of the Ashanti Empire began to lay out the framework for his own indigenous African industrial revolution. He started with a booming firearms industry with the assistance of the Dutch. During and after modernizing his military, his focus would be on infrastructure. This would be necessary to keep his troops mobile and well supplied. West Africa has been home to countless urban settlements and densely populated cities. While many of these cities were known to have had excellent local route systems and complex networks and walls and moats, a reliable infrastructure that linked multiple cities was largely absent in most major cities, relying on rivers rather than road systems to connect with one another. Fortunately, West Africa contains several large navigable rivers and without them, one would have had to cross the unforgiving terrain of West Africa by foot or possibly by horseback. So as long as they were in the region that was a fair distance from the tsetse fly, an insect that runs rampant throughout the tropical forests of Africa. Tsetse flies are a vector for the sleeping sickness in humans, a disease that is virtually always deadly to horses and other non-indigenous livestock. Seeing as the fact that the Shasi Empire was located deep within the tropical forests of West Africa, the tsetse fly would most certainly be present. With that said, Pempe would primarily focus on railroads as a means of being able to efficiently transport goods, resources, supplies, and personnel throughout his ever-growing empire. Road systems would likely be expanded upon as well, but all serious efforts to do so would come only after the advent of vehicles. Though this area would not be the primary focus, it would still be something bearing a fair degree of emphasis. Why? Because in our real timeline, there was already a well-developed road system throughout the Ashanti Empire, which 19th century European travelers praised and described it as a network that connected all major capitals and strategic points. These roads required an enormous amount of local labor to maintain, and if left neglected for any length of time, would quickly become reclaimed by the rainforests. Nevertheless, railroads remain the most useful and efficient method of transport until the advent of modernized vehicles. In order to produce the local labor required for these ambitious infrastructural projects, however, one of the darker sides of the institution would be revealed. Slavery Though African slavery generally differed significantly from the chattel slavery formerly practiced by European powers, it was still widely practiced in various parts of the African continent throughout history. 
As mentioned in part one, a booming firearms industry would lead to the conquest of neighboring peoples, which naturally produced large quantities of prisoners and war captives. In our real timeline, the expansion of the Ashanti Empire also led to war captives and prisoners which were sold to European traders on the coast. This is one of the primary sources of wealth generated by the Ashanti. During Prempeh's reign, however, slavery had been abolished by European powers for over a half a century. The African blockade of 1808 to 1870 also prevented any large-scale transport of slaves to the New World. Throughout much of Africa's history, slavery was a fact of life. Some regions primarily relied on slave labor, and in some cases, kingdoms would build the bulk of their military out of enslaved individuals, such as the case of the troops of the Mali Empire and subsequent Mandinka polities who utilized enslaved warriors known as Sofa. However, for the most part, it was quite different from the chattel slavery practice in European colonies. People were not enslaved solely on the basis of their race, nor were they born into slavery simply due to their parents being slaves. Slavery was often a form of punishment imposed on an individual for their own crimes. In some cases, slaves even had lawful rights laid out by the governing powers, such as the case with the Kurakan Fuga of the Mali Empire's constitution. It specifically instructed slave owners to give their slaves at least one day out of every week to rest and strongly discouraged their mistreatment. At one point, a slave by the name of Sakura even rose to become a war general and ultimately emperor of the Mali Empire even expanding the territory of Mali and establishing new diplomatic ties. By no means is this an attempt to justify African slavery, but the fact remains that the dehumanizing effect that the Arabic and European slave institutions had on African people was virtually absent in Africa, as slaves were still afforded rights, still considered human beings, and were not classified as genetically inferior to their masters. After European traders began purchasing slaves, some African kingdoms began deliberately raiding their neighbors for the sole purpose of capturing and selling slaves to their new European trade partners. This same type of economy had also existed in some other regions of Africa for centuries prior, but with Arab merchants. By the 1860s, most of the West had banned slavery to some extent, with the British even using it as a justification for colonizing parts of West Africa. As mentioned before, the British installed a naval blockade of ships guarding the West African coast between the years of 1808 and 1870 to intercept any would-be slave trading ships sailing to or from Africa. This would have further encouraged the Ashanti to retain slaves as part of its own local labor force, which in our alternate timeline would lead to a bolstering growth in the economy and infrastructure. Tropical Africa is rich in natural resources such as palm oil, latex, coal, petroleum, and many other important ingredients for industrialized nations. In our real timeline, this was one of several reasons why the scramble for Africa happened in the first place. These newly industrializing countries of Europe wanted to take control of Africa's rich natural resources as they were important for powering and lubricating the new factories that were cropping up all throughout the European continent, as well as some of these raw materials directly contributing to the resources needed for the actual goods that were being produced in these factories. In our alternate timeline, the Ashanti Empire would have already begun its own industrialization program and defeated all would-be European conquerors with their locally manufactured modern weaponry. And I know I may seem a little overconfident in saying that the Ashanti would have defeated them, but bear in mind, even with incredibly outdated flintlock muskets, the Ashanti still proved to be an incredibly difficult, well-ordered, and disciplined fighting force when the British faced off against them in a period spanning roughly 100 years. The British suffered multiple defeats at the hands of the Ashanti in a series of conflicts known as the Anglo-Ashanti Wars until the advent of modern technology gave them the upper hand. Had the Ashanti possessed the same military technology as the British, I think it's safe to assume that it would have been nearly impossible for the British to establish control of the region without stretching her troops or resources too thin. Italy made this same horrible mistake in the 1896 Battle of Adwa, where they suffered a crushing defeat from an indigenous Ethiopian fighting force equipped with modern firearms. This led to civil strife and public opposition among the common people, criticizing Italian colonial ventures, which forced them to abandon all future colonial expansion into Africa. In our alternate timeline, this trend of industrialization would also continue throughout much of West Africa, through trade, warfare, and even possibly spreading to the Horn of Africa and Central Africa to a lesser extent. Not only would trade and warfare spread this trend, but in a more general sense, the Ashanti would have a set an example for the rest of Africa, demonstrating that they were capable of building their own countries to a point of being on par with European countries, similar to how Ethiopia served as a banner of hope for the African independence movement. 
A relic of this mentality can be found in the coloration of most modern African flags, which adopted red, yellow, and green coloration of the Ethiopian flag, the only African country to successfully resist colonization. So if the Ashanti were to successfully industrialize, a similar level of inspiration could potentially take shape and the Ashanti would be seen as a model nation for West African kingdoms to emulate. Economic and military competition would bolster this incentive. In addition to this, West Africa wouldn't even need to completely industrialize to the level of Europe's nations to deter colonization. It would only have to be just enough to deter European powers from wanting to invest the time, resources, or manpower into colonial ventures, and compel them to opt for trade agreements rather than direct control. This pattern can be seen when comparing Africa to the Americas back in the 15th and 16th centuries, where European powers quickly learned that indigenous African states proved just too challenging to outright conquer as they had done in the Americas. This was due to the fact that unlike the Americas, Africa contained large populations, iron technology, immunity to European diseases, and just generally a larger collection of centralized states. With that said, it would have required unfeasibly large-scale forces to subdue African states at the time, a fact that remained true until the 19th century with the advent of modern weaponry. In our alternate timeline, this would allow West African states to grow and transition nationally on their own terms as they assimilate themselves into the global economy, controlling a substantial chunk of the resources that fueled the Industrial Revolution, and eventually put them in a very strong position in the world's economy. And uh, going back briefly onto the topic of slavery, we can naturally assume that as societies begin to grow and develop throughout Africa, human rights activism would discourage slavery, just as it has been done in our real timeline and we would likely see a much different Africa than the one that we see today. It would be a landmass of hundreds of independent polities of varying degrees of power and influence and bearing more indigenous official names, religions, and languages. The weaker and more isolated nations would likely be annexed into those that are more industrialized. World politics and culture wouldn't just be West versus East or Oriental versus Occidental. There would be a triad of categories as Africa would have its own formidable presence in the world stage as well. With West Africa's strong presence in the developed world, we can expect to see human rights violations against blacks in the United States significantly reduced or thwarted in a shorter amount of time than in our real timeline. Wealth distribution of the world will be much more proportionate than it is today. This is because Western powers of today are possible largely due to forced labor and colonial exploits of Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries, and even the present in the form of neocolonialism. Had wealth been distributed through trade rather than conquest, this would not be the case, and we could expect to see powers like the United Kingdom and France having significantly less power or influence on the world. With that said, and it may be far-fetched, but it is also quite possible that the world wars would have never even happened. Of course though, it is impossible to say for sure how this scenario would play out, but as per usual, it's all just theory crafting, and you're welcome to share your own opinions as well in the comment section. I really hope you guys enjoyed this scenario, and don't forget that this was a patron request. If you'd like to make a request of your own, you could do so by becoming a patron. The link to this can be found in the comment section below. Thanks for watching guys, and always remember, we don't come from nothing. <laughs>